Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Professor Emeritus of Hispanic Studies, Senior Brownstone Scholar and author of the just published The Treason of the Experts, COVID and the Credential Class, Thomas Harrington. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Profe. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, boy. We spoke last year on my TNT radio, and now we're meeting virtually face to face for the first time. And now uh, you've got a new book out. Uh, again, the title is uh, "The Treason of the Experts." And if you want to tell us, you know, just to start a bit about um, the book, yeah. Well, I'll start with the title. Uh, it may bring some bells in, in some people's mind. It's the, the there's a famous book written in 1927 by the French intellectual Julien Banda called the the la trahison des clercs the the the, the uh, treason of the clerks or of the the educated class and he wrote it in uh, the wake of world war 1 and it's a reflection on how the elites in both france and germany had betrayed their role as guarantors of the search for culture uh for for truth in culture uh at that time and it's a, it's a searing indictment of of the way they all rolled over and that's the way I felt these last few years. And the second part, of course, is the credentialed class, uh, which I think adds another aspect to it, because uh, I wanted to separate the ideas of having a credential and actually being wise or intelligent. And I think the gap, and we can talk about some of the reasons why, that gap between the credential and the wisdom it's supposed to represent is getting wider all the time. And has a lot to do with the way the university industry has uh, deployed itself in these last 30 and 40 years. But it has another factor that I think has to do with the way our society has become divided socioeconomically. And so we've lived in, we've begun to live in uh, compartimentos estancos, as Ortega Gasset once said, which is to say airtight categories where we don't uh, talk across cultural and, and class lines. Uh, and so that's what it is. It's it's kind of a chronicle in the sense that these are essays that I've written over a period of two and a half years during the COVID crisis, in which at one time I'm, I'm both expressing my incredulity, but I'm also trying to understand it as a cultural historian. What made us uh, apt for, for this sort of attempted takeover? And why were we rolled so easily? Uh, and these are quite things that I come at at an angle of someone who's looked for many years at how large large social belief systems are generated through the use of cultural manipulation. My particular area is was looking at how nation, national identities are generated and deployed uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. But then once you begin to look at it from a structural point of view, you begin to apply the idea of culture planning, which is a term I can explain in greater detail, is used in all sorts of areas to create be realities. And, you know, that's always a, a, in commas, uh, in, in, in quotation marks, realities that become active in our, in our social life. So it's kind of from that point of view that I, I was looking and am looking at the COVID, uh, at the COVID phenomenon. Throughout history, empires have risen and fallen. Some of the most successful empires were those that offered people a reason to come, often lower taxes and the prospect of citizenship. In ancient times, empires would say foreigners can become one of us and prosper through business and trade. Throughout history, people have gravitated to jurisdictions that have given them the best conditions to do business. So if you run a business, you should consider nomad capitalists because they help entrepreneurs and investors relocate to parts of the world where they can keep more of their wealth. They literally wrote the book on it, The Best-Selling Nomad Capitalist. Find it on Amazon. If you're an entrepreneur or investor and believe you're paying too much in tax, or if you'd like to get a second passport or a third passport like I have to expand your options and not have to be reliant on one government, there are legal ways to do this. Nomad Capitalist has been assisting over a 1,000 clients for the last 10 years. You can check out their 2,000 plus educational YouTube videos and nearly 2,000 blogs. Just go to nomadcapitalist.com, learn how they can help you legally reduce your tax bill, expand your options globally, and navigate the algorithm ghetto. And you know, I, I've been reading your writings the past couple of years. That's why I initially reached out to you uh, 
last year i, I love brownstone uh, i love the work that you and fellow uh, scholars there and contributors are doing i mean it's you know i, I Je you know shout out again to jeffrey tucker because i followed him uh from the pre-brownstone days i think he was with mises and, and, and stuff like that or yeah. doing austrian economics and then brownstone is just bringing together people from all walks to, to fight against tyranny and defend uh liberty but you know uh and, and what you talk about i mean i've been asking myself these same questions myself you know being you know as uh having a master's degree having taught at the you know universities and schools a credentialed class and trying to figure out what how are people fall falling for this but before maybe getting to that the one theme throughout your book is and your writings is 9 11. Uh, and this is interesting for people like yourself and myself and many of my guests here we all of us noticed this this trend parallels between 9 11 and what i call COVID 9 11 uh where you you mentioned 9 11 the patriot act uh you know the, this this t t terrorism narrative that they push on us and this grab for our civil liberties and it's like we've seen the same thing exactly happen with a lot of the same overlapping overlapping uh actors so you know and, and any thoughts on you know why is it that you cite 9 11 uh you know when uh, it comes to COVID, i'm so glad you picked that up in in my book thank you for that um and before i forget another shout out to jeffrey tucker who as you correctly say he came from a place of libertarian activism but he has created a catholic with a small c meaning variety a place where very different voices come together in liberty and he's done so very cleverly and very deftly so that we keep our eye on the question of liberty. I don't come from the libertarian uh, the libertarian right, so-called, if you want to call it that. I come from a, a very different place, a more traditional left. But I find myself very much uh, at home there and that the spirit of dialogue is very real at a time when dialogue's uh, going, going away. But back to 9-11. Um, 9-11 was where, really where I had a wake-up call, uh, because if you're a person that looks at, pat you're, you're either disposed or skilled or both at looking at pattern recognition, uh, which I think is key and one of the things that I think our media wants to deprive us from having, they want us to have uh, fragmented views, snapshots of reality, where we never look at the whole picture and then look at the broad trends within it. And I think it was my work as a scholar of nationalism and seeing how cultural material was organized in order to militate toward a given end that made me very sensitive to what went on at 9-11. And I can tell you immediately, and then it was only enhanced when it came up with, with COVID, you know what's organic within a culture. You know when change is organic, or what to the extent it can ever be fully organic, there's always going to be elites pushing change. And you know, if you study culture closely, that there are moments where things are fomented with such a crassness and a brutality and a, a, a dramatic change that they couldn't possibly be organic. Uh, and in that sense, September 11th was a wake up call for me. I said, this, none of this added up organically. The reaction was not. Uh, the right size for what had happened, the sense of of certain truths that had to be rolled out was not uh, organic. The way that we suddenly had people going after anyone who 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 had any discrepancy with the narrative didn't make sense to me. That Susan Sontag, the great American intellectual, could be turned into a devil overnight simply because she asked, as she always did, very good questions about what was going on. And so for me, I think one of the things that has been interesting now that I am talking and working with people coming from both the traditional right and the libertarian right, that none of them seem to see, the libertarians, yes, but the traditional Republicans who are now part of this coalition we have going, they're acting as if this sort of uh, action is is all new, and they're shocked at it, as are many mainstream Democrats who've gotten on board. And I often feel like that's that sage old band who's saying, 
There's nothing new, but you can't be that obnoxious person because it doesn't get you anywhere. But I feel like saying a lot of times, if you were paying attention, this is a continuation of the same methods uh, that were used. And insofar as I can help people, hopefully nicely and intelligently, draw the lines of continuity between what went on in the early part of the century and what began taking place in the spring of 220, I think it's a service that's necessary. And it gets you into broader ideas and the scales fall from your eyes and you begin to say, wow, we're living in a world where we are seen as manipulable by an ever increasing and ever more powerful elite that has a lot of tools at their disposal to do so. Yeah, it just makes me think it's been now pretty much 20 years since uh, I came to have the view on 9-11 opposite of the official narrative. And again, recently, one of my guests on Geopolitics and Empire was Richard Gage, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. So that kind (laughs) of tells you where I'm uh, at. But uh, now maybe to ask about to get into, you know, the the experts, these uh, elites, which I think is one of the core problems that, that enabled, uh, you know, th- this credentialed class of, of citizenry, and uh, which is what enabled, you know, whoever was, as you said, fomenting, pushing uh, the COVID regime, they couldn't have done it without this class. And you, you, you write things like, and this is true that quote elites, uh, uh, well, basically that elites have ever more open disdain. For the intelligence of the citizenry that where we watched as they mocked and ignored world-class doctors and scientists uh, and then you you know as well the the expert class uh which you you mean are the liberal professions possessing postgraduate degrees and you know it's all about credentials and and lab coats and prestige and status and and glory and then uh i think there's a lot of ego and narcissism and financial status so you know what, what can you tell us about <laughs> this oh, so class? many so many things um i can take it in a lot of different directions but let's first look at the fact that those who have presented these elites to us and told us not to question them are seizing upon a very integral part of the american experience which is through education you will become excellent and that's an integral part of the american dream But it depends on the idea that you will do so with integrity and that you will do so with a sense of service and a a belief in the dignity of other people with whom you might be over whom you might be able to exercise power. And so people are on autopilot. They go educated. Good. uh, Highly credentialed. Spent a lot of time studying. Good. What's not to like? Well, what's not to like is what has happened, for lack of a better term, uh, to the the pursuit of virtue along with the pursuit of knowledge. And I know that's one of those old-fashioned words that we don't bring up, but virtue and authority, if you go into the roots of the word authority, it's the same word as authorship. Authority is not the same as power. Sometimes authority will conf- power will be conferred upon people who have authority. But the idea of authority is authorship over oneself, control of oneself, achievement of discipline, achievement of knowledge. It's not about using that knowledge for power's sake. And those two things have gotten terribly confused in our culture, where people have been, I think, under the emphasis, uh, under, under the influence of consumer culture. Have begun to confuse the idea, I because I can, I must, or because I can, why not? And that speaks to a lack of internal moral restraint that has a lot to do with virtue. Uh, and somewhere along the line, and we could talk about the reasons why that element has been dispensed with. That's one factor. Another one is what has what has happened to our educational institutions in terms of social class. When I went to college in the late, early, very late seventies, early eighties, and I speak from my hometown of in Massachusetts, we all thought and knew we could go to college, and we didn't have much worry about being burdened with debts that would cripple our ability to do anything other than go into highly remunerated fields. 
So education truly was a pathway to either getting into the middle class or staying in it or moving up within it. Well, when you had the inflation of, of, of cost for, for these schools, when they started taking away state support for state institutions, which used to be $500 a year, 1000 a year, and now to go to the state institution, you need to pay 30 and take out loans. That creates a system of indentured servitude. And who are the ones, who are the only people that don't get caught in the, the trap of indentured servitude? Those who have families well, enough, uh, well off enough to pay the whole freight, which then in turn leaves them to be free to take the luxury, if you will, of going into the liberal professions. And I'll give you an anecdote that I think spells it out very well. When I got my PhD, uh, I had a stipend. I had tuition remission. I had a small stipend that allowed me to make it through the month, and <laughs> often sharing food with my, my buddy from Spain. But I, 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 I wasn't going into debt to become a professor, which is an uncertain path, as you probably know. I mean, who gets to, to finish the PhD, then who gets a tenure track job, and then who gets the tenure, blah, 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 blah. My daughter, who's a really sharp person with a very fine academic style mind, she's a, she's a muscular thinker, I, I call her. She thought of getting her PhD. In fact, she applied to some prestigious programs, uh, one out in LA, and the one she really wanted to get to, and she got in. And they said, here's what we have to offer you, uh, $8,000 a year to live in the center of LA. Well, being a smart kid, she said, you know, Daddy, this is nuts. What can I do with that? Well, who could afford that? The people who can say, go back to their parents and say, hey, Mom and Dad, I'm going to get this PhD. Can you freight me? Uh, the, the, can, can you front me the, the, the cost of it over the next six years? Well, who's going to get their PhDs now? That class. And that class now increasingly controls our institutions. So it's not a kid who's made it up from the middle class. It's increasingly an endogamic circle where people are all from an upper middle class or upper class uh, background, and they come with all of the implicit biases of that class. And they're not even aware of it, but then it soon becomes a racket in which you're reproducing uh, the sort of sociology of the upper middle class. You see it at the New York Times. I mean, yesterday, the, the ridiculous writers at the New York Times, who are all this now, and there's no more Jimmy Breslin's, uh, they all looked at the, the decision by Judge Doughty down in Louisiana, and they said, oh, isn't it awful? We're not going to be able to protect poor people from knowing what they shouldn't know. And that was the tone of the article. Well, what does that say? That says we're a group of people who, A, are convinced we know better. We're a group of people who are convinced other people are dopes. And we see it as our birthright to exercise control over the inputs that uh, these poor, unwashed people are capable of dealing with. Because you know how those people are. They wouldn't be able to figure out it on their own. So we got to call this disinformation and this misinformation. It's all pure censorship. Because basically they believe there's no one who, like them, if they had the inputs, could figure it out on their own. And this is what we're seeing constantly in this country. Yeah, th this reminds me during... Uh... Uh, the, the age of Corona, as I'll uh, call it, I, I even had former students of mine because I taught at the top, top high school and university in Mexico, the Tec de Monterrey. Uh, that's where the millionaires send their kids. It's the only school in Latin America uh, that's uh, that it goes to the World Economic Forum. They're officially allied with the World Economic uh, Forum, and they've had Hillary Clinton and, and Bill Gates speak at the graduations. Uh, and anyways, uh, some of my kids during they, they see me posting this stuff like you, the, the, the counter narrative to COVID-1984, as I call it. And some of these kids were, were this credentialed class. Some of them came from uh, their families had millions or uh, and or they were studying medicine and having those lab coats and full on this liberal credentialed class ideology. And they espoused great disdain for for uh for 
those of us with with lower lesser credentials lower economic status or anyone questioning things and they would mock me they would you know mock me for having a view uh that was not approved uh you know my own like former high school uh students and it's just and, and look where we are now a lot of what people like yourself and my said myself that we've said has has come true we've accurately projected things uh thanks to what i think at the beginning of your book what what, what you already mentioned our, our ability to recognize uh patterns but uh there's a fascinating part in your book as well that i think is key the not credentialed class and when you you know i i had that experience here when i i was trying to get everyone's opinions like, hey what do you think about all this COVID stuff and government lockdowns. And you talk to the the working class, as you mentioned in your book, where there are people who went on not wearing masks, they, they have to do, do the daily work, the, dirt, the, the dirty work, getting the hands dirty. And they're like, there's no, there's really no pandemic. Well, what's, what, what's going on? And um, just any, any thoughts on the not credentialed class? Uh, a lot. Um, if the essay you're talking about, it's the one where I was talking uh, up, up in the rural area, with, with a lot of the workers who were uh, doing work throughout, you know, you don't want to fall into the trap of, because I come from the credential class, of, of, of glorifying as if there's a special wisdom. But there is a special wisdom in, in a certain sense in that, different from the credential class, these people live in a physical, empirical world. They live in a place where, rather than abstractions, I mean, after all, we live ever more in a world of, of mediated abstractions where we're take where people are telling us that what you're seeing is not true because I have an explanation from it that tells you it's not true. But then you touch it, you feel it, and you see it, and you say it is true. The vaccines don't stop transmission, <laughs> for example. Uh, they don't. And yet, how many people having who live in a world of abstractions created by the media machine, refused to believe the empirical, undeniable empirical fact that they never did anything, they weren't tested for it. Well, if you're not living in that world of imposed or mediating abstractions that are being given to you by the fabulists of the credentialed class, you go, hmm, let me see. How many people do I know have gotten sick? How bad was it when they got sick? How many people are dying, et cetera, et cetera. And then with the internet, these people go to the internet and they go, oh, I looked up the statistics. They basically jibe with what I'm seeing in my world and is at complete variance by what the media machine is telling you. And instead of going with the media message, they go with the empirical inputs in their life. And I think this is a huge issue. Uh, you know, the old expression, don't believe your lying eyes. Basically, we're being told all the time to don't believe your lying eyes because someone who out of some necromancy, some uh, some control of things that are beyond your grasp has the inside view that what you're seeing couldn't possibly be true. Now, of course, there are people that see behind and see things, and I'm I'm. Per- proposing to be one of them in, in inciting trends. But this idea that what is a straight out empirical reality that you can feel and touch and see, and to be told by someone, no, that's not true, because I say so. Because see, I've got this degree. This is going on all the time in our life. And and I think also what you mentioned is 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 key because again, there's a lot of disdain for the lower socioeconomic class, for the uh people who don't have high school diplomas or uh bachelor's uh, degrees and i i've never held that view i i w- i've always viewed the human person as as equal whether you've never finished high school or you've got a master's degree and um you know and then speaking about you know college debts you know how many blue collar workers today plumbers and carpenters are making more money than some of these uh you know, young folks uh, now with these liberal uh, degrees, but you also mentioned calculating risk. And it's true. I've seen it like in people like my father, who was a you know blue, blue painter, blue collar worker. And these are dangerous industries and, and economically as well as physically. And you have to calculate risk and or, or you won't survive. And I exactly. think they've been exposed to greater danger 
these the, this non-credential class than these these people who live in these you know ivory towers no yeah yeah I mean, you're talking about the article where i contrast the fright of my colleagues on zoom before the credential before the covid threat so called and the the carpenters and painters living in this neighborhood where i where i was and it was it was almost laughable the ones who they've never i've never let's face it i'll I'll speak for myself you know once i became tenured uh, as a college professor a lot of the need to sell myself every day and calculate risk and go out was removed from my life but i like to think i was empathetic enough with a vision of life to see wow someone else is constantly calculating risk and maybe that makes them pretty good at it and maybe better than me with my relatively safe and abstract world i mean that's one thing the other part of it i think um is something you said which really strikes home with me fundamental to my upbringing in my family was the ab- the assumption of absolute equality on the human level and the presumption that everyone is worth and this is a word i love that i'm i think i'm going to be writing more on dignity that that dignity is the ultimate uh thing that we need to afford ourselves and from there everyone else and i think what has happened is we're not only in a crisis of empiricism but we're in a crisis of socialization which happens to have a lot to do with empiricism sitting at a table conversing with different types of people traveling you know there's one of the the pieces i do it's called the frightened class in which i suggest that this upper class is both imperious and frightened at the same time and it's a weird it's a weird combination if you're going to be imperious and have all why do you frighten them well i think a lot of them are frightened because they've been funneled into narrow class based promotions the uh, programs of social promotion which have deprived them of the idea of sitting down and talking with people outside their social class and learning languages for doing so i've been incredibly blessed not only because my parents had that as a key thing and said you never talk and never believe anything differently about anyone no matter what their class is because they are a person that has something to bring to you in your life but also to travel and do it across languages and to do it in various countries it's an incredibly enriching experience that makes you question all sorts of things uh that you thought were just plain old truths. Uh I don't know if I mentioned in the book but I turning point in me was being in Poland in 1983 during solidarity solidarność and meeting people uh who were I was a house painter after having graduated from college didn't know what I was going to do I was over there because I had a professor that said, "Hey, you like Poland? Go over for 300 bucks and spend the summer." Life-changing event. I'm meeting PhDs who don't have enough to eat. I'm meeting people who are 10 times more cultured than I'll ever think of being and they're struggling in Poland. Well, what did that tell me about the nature of the things the way life works? It said, "Whoa, kid. Maybe there's a whole bunch of mechanics going on here that you need to know about. And when you start doing that and then you start talking to people and you start finding wisdom, you know, it's it's like harvest you go around looking for wisdom. You hope to give people each person you meet the opportunity to show you what wisdom they have. It's a it's in some ways it's a greedy thing. Because you want to be you want to and but if you think that well there are smart people there are dumb people i never meet them at my table my dad and mom when we go out never talk to them never encourage me to talk to them well what are you going to do you're going to think the world works that way no i mean that that's uh very good and you know i think people know i mean my life experience i've just been it's been uh, uh amazing having lived uh you know mongolia kazakhstan croatia i've been to switzerland um now mexico and, and just it's just so much richness and you know uh, being exposed to credential people as you mentioned 
uh, non-credentialed people, different cultures and that, and, and the different difficult situations people find themselves in. And then that kind of breaks you out of that whole Western uh, credentialed class m- mentality. And it's, you know, it's it's sad that people don't get enough of that uh, ex- exposure. I'm glad you mentioned the frightened class. That was my next uh, question. You're reading uh, my, my mind. But um, y- you also talk about technocracy, uh, the concept of technocracy and the practice of yeah. authoritarianism. And you say that the term technocrat first came into wide usage in the late 50s when uh, Francisco Franco, the Spanish dictator, entrusted the management of his country's economy to a group of thinkers from the ultra right wing Catholic organization Opus Dei. And the central conceit of technocratic thought was and is that there exists in data based scientific knowledge a clarity that if bottled and distributed correctly will free us from all t- types of noisome and unproductive uh, debate. And I think that's what we're seeing today with all this AI stuff. And, you know, basically, you know, transhumanism is like the next thing. And they, they sell us this idea that technology is going to be all perfect and, and neutral and, and pristine. And, and I, it's there. Th- we've seen with chat GPT, like it's, it's the, yeah. the, the biases of the programmers, uh, uh, come out. So there's no such thing, but, you know, I, I've interviewed Patrick Wood on this, uh, podcast, who's one of the top, uh, uh explainers of technocracy. And it's, it's a totalitarian, dystopian, you know, eugenicist, anti-human system, if you ask me. And I think COVID, what they rolled out with COVID was, you know, up until now in history, one of the most, uh, you know, biggest forms of technocracy we've ever seen. And and uh, I think they're planning more. What, what are your thoughts on technocracy? Just to, I'll just go back on a little bit of the history of te- technocracy in Spain. As you probably know, Spain, well, people don't know this, unfortunately. People always compare our empire to either Rome or Great Britain. But in many ways, the Spanish empire, which really was from 1492 to 1898, is in many ways the best parallel. It was a globe-spanning empire. It was an empire that was warring. And it was an empire that, like all empires, began to fade. And it was a long fade. And this is one of the questions we have to think about. Will ours be a short one or will it be a long one? We're clearly in the fade. But what happens to a society in a fade? Well, Spain, Spain through by remaining Catholic throughout the Counter-Reformation, at a time when Protestantism was being created in the northern countries, and from there, if you believe in Max Weber, capitalism coming along with it, Spain didn't engage in all of that. So as democracy, so-called, or, you know, in whatever form, began to be uh, a value in the latter part of the 19th century, popular democracy, Spain had no tools at its disposal. And it kept on saying, we're a great nation, we're a great nation. And then in 1898, it loses its last colonies. And all of a sudden, the the educated classes in, in, in Spain began to say, let's have democracy. But they were there was no practice of democracy in the country. And then we, so the, the first parliamentary attempts at it were very awkward and manipulated. And in the face of that manipulation, the traditionalists came back and said, see, democracy is impossible. What we need, and this is the, 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 they were called the anti-parliamentarians. What we need is a clairvoyant class of people, perhaps military, who are not political people, who will save us from all of that messiness. That's in the 20s. Spanish Civil War takes place where a lot of those people working on that premise imposed an elite control, a brutal elite control. And then as Franco's regime needed to open up to the world, it needed to get capital investment. He said, well, this isn't working. How can we get capital investment in here but keeping control on the society? So he got these young economists and they said, okay, we'll we'll lift capital controls We'll let foreign investment come in, but we'll keep an eye on it at all. And we have these wise men, the technocrats. Well, that's absurd. These guys were non-ideological, non-ideological. No one's ever (laughs) non-ideological. This is one of of the great problems I think Americans have with media and a whole bunch of other things. They say, I just want objective news. Well, good luck with that. Because what it's saying, and, and of course, the disinformation industry the censorship industry feeds on us because people want to buy truth the way they buy stuff at Walmart. Oh, give me a, give me a pound of truth. Give me five pounds of truth. I don't want the message. Well, 
Truth is a process and it's never ending. But if you can convince people that A, it can be achieved perfectly, and that B, I'll save you the work of having to do it, then you set up a mentality of client patron relationship between the tech, to the so called elites who will say, I'm glad to sell it to you. Oh, and by the way, I'll sell it to you in packages that are quite advantageous to me. And if you're willing to go for that deal and give up your agency, we're delighted. And this is where we stand. And this is a real crisis of, on, on a lot of levels. It's a failure of our educational system that ideas this simplistic of truth can be solved. Anyone who's dealing with complexity of life knows that truth is a destination and never, it, it's, a, it's a, it, a would be destination. Uh, you can't, you'll never get there. And living with the contingency of truth is part of your job. And now we have these people say, no, I'm going to save you from that anxiety, that contingency. And of course, they're doing it in a moment where they're flooding us with information, which overwhelms most people's capacity to assimilate it and make sense of it. So, in many ways, and you and I talked off air about Gladio, we are in many ways dealing with a Gladio of information, Gladio being the Italian movement of the, the 70s and 80s, wherein the Italian state worried about a communist or socialist takeover of the government, attacked its own people on the premise that in attacking people and frightening them, people will run to establish, run to the embrace of the established order. Well, they've done exactly the same with information. They flooded us with information. People feel adrift within it. And they say, oh, no problem. I've got your solution. And it's the same dynamic. Create the problem or foment the problem, and then provide the simplistic solution that just happens to be very amenable to elite power. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. It's ahead. striking to me how repeatedly this goes on and how repeatedly very bright people, whom I respect in all other areas, are incapable of picking up on the re repetitive structures of these types of arguments that problem fomented solution granted loss of freedom gaining of control by the elites yeah i mean the, 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 i don't know what you call it whether they're so naive they're afraid to confront this evil and dark reality uh i think it would, they would have to alter completely their world view i mean uh, what, what you're talking about is state terrorism false flag operations. The late Lance DeHaven Smith, who I interviewed a couple of years back, he calls it SCAD, State Crimes Against... Wonderful book. Yes, uh, I've got it behind me, Conspiracy Theater America, State Crimes Against uh, Democracy. And yet, yeah, as I mentioned, Daniela Ganser of NATO Secret Armies, uh, Gladio fame. He was on the podcast. Uh, recently, we talked about his new book on empire. But um, yeah, I don't know if you're spying on my notes. That was my next one of my <laughs> upcoming questions. But uh, as well, my, my, my next question was, you, you write in your book, Quote, and yet we now have companies tied uh, umbilically to the e U.S., EU, Israeli axis of military and business power now telling us that they have algorithms that can free us from that inherent messiness by eliminating fake news from our screens. Do you really think that they have no ulterior motive in offering this supposed uh, service to us? You also mentioned the quote that most people in the country uh, apparently buy into this transparently lame a technocratic apology for flat out discourse control is perhaps the most frightening aspect of all. I and mean, just yesterday, I was just, I, you know, I, I read Rand Corporation, you know, the, like the Pentagon's brain, which is, you know, one of the core centers sources of this problem. And they're coming out uh, yesterday. They, they've got a new term now, truth decay. And they're complaining about truth decay, you know, conspiracy theorists and people not believing us anymore. It's like because you're, you're lying, you're evil, you're 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 sinister. Um, and you know, my, Mike Benz, who does great work at the Freedom Wonderful Foundation, work. yeah, for, he just tweets today. He says, "Rule number one: the rule number one, never accept the legitimacy of the term researcher in the disinfo space. Never there. Government cutouts, censorship operatives. Uh, the one thing they damn sure aren't is." researchers and kind of as you're mentioning there's this push now 
to uh control information control the the truth disinformation and you also mentioned in your book i don't have the quote but you know anyone who just doesn't believe the government is anti-semite far-right extremist terrorist i mean it's absolutely in, in, insane and uh just a, a, any further thought <laughs> on this direction yeah i mean there's, there's so many ways i, I could go with it well, I, I'll just jump back to Italy for a second, since I just was spending time there and I got to know some interesting people within the COVID uh, questioning community over there. Some wonderful doctors very bravely stood up to some things. And I got to know a guy uh, who, who remained nameless, but he was uh, living in Veneto, which is near where we had a base uh or still have a base up in northern Italy, if I'm not mistaken. And he said something very interesting. And, and he's he knows he's a biochemist and he knows what he speaks of. He said, yeah, I was at the time, I was a professional football player, second division. And I got involved with these guys who were in, in the area. And he said, you know, just a few years before we had had large, um, we had had large protests against American influence in, in Italy. And he said, you know, there was a lot of pot smoking that along with that, but there was a lively social life too. He goes, within uh, two or three years, I got in touch with some of the guys and there was a heroin epidemic uh, throughout all of these people. And lo and behold, all the activism came to a halt. Now, I can't vouch for any of that. I can't say that it's true. I wouldn't go out on a limb and just say because he said it, but this is a, a very right guy. All I would say is we have to be open to the fact, you know, if you've read stuff like Douglas Valentine's book, uh, you have to be open to the fact that, yes, there very well might be, a, you know, the sending in of drugs to tame popular resistance and, and, and so on and so forth. But I think it gets to a larger point, which you, you touch on, which is our worldviews are very precious to us. They're the way we make sense of a chaotic world. And we love figuring out something that appears to make sense to us at a given moment in our life. We need to do that. If we don't do that, we will live chaotic lives. Something I think you're starting to see about among younger people today is that in, in the onslaught and in the absence of socialization rituals that give them basis to hold on to, they're having trouble and they're, they're beginning to feel chaotic. So we need to organize our lives. And at a certain point, we begin choosing among given models that the society presents us politically, socially, and what have you. Great stuff. And then we begin to work within the model, and it, it makes sense of the world for us. The key is that that not ossify. And I think what happens in a lot of people, they say, I figured it out, or this model works for me, and this is the way I'm going to continue to make sense of the world. Well, what happens when a group of unscrupulous people come along, knowing that you have subscribe to what we might call a lifestyle brand. And then they say, now that we have them indoctrinated indoct into that brand, we can take the brand places where we want to take it. And it's at that point that people say, hmm, do I love my brand and the comfort it's given me up? Or am I able to admit that someone is commandeering my brand, which has given me comfort, and I might have to ask new questions about where I might find another model of life or another parameter which will allow me to make sense of life. And I think that's where, you know, we're, we're taught to be branded now. Branding is, and I, I have a piece in the book about branding. Branding, you know, people start wearing things. I, you'll notice I never wear anything on my shirt because I don't want to participate in that um, to the best extent I can. It's very difficult to do now. but. Somewhere in the 80s, branding became all the thing. So if you could create loyalty to the brand, well, we see this happen all the time. Once the loyalty is created, 
Then you just diminish the quality, make it cheaper. And for about three or four buys before the people figure out they're now, ex, you know, they're out, they're now selling junk, what was once a premium product. But in that interim, they have the alliance of people. Well, they do the exact same thing with ideologies. What does the Democratic Party have to do in any way, shape, or form with a party that used to fight for the common man? And yet, many people joined on that premise of that branding, and they're unwilling or unable to say how much that branding has got, how far it's gotten from the actual reality of what that party does day to day. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it's a perfect explanation. And and <clears throat> even, you know, I kind of figured this stuff out uh, a long time ago where, you know, you have to have that agency, sovereignty, capacity to change your brand or exactly. modify your brand or not be in part of a brand or put together different pieces of different brands. And as I think you, you hit the nail on the head where most people um, are afraid, are cowardly. Uh, they don't want to lose that security and comfort financial social that come with being it's it's being in a group that brand and so the and most people we saw this with covid it's it's a human thing being part of a group they're afraid to step outside and be that black sheep um and i i did also want to get your thoughts on my biggest fear with covid and everything is you know by the way i had doug valentine as well on the podcast a couple years Did you back. really yeah so there's like almost no one i haven't talked to but um yeah it's in the archives but uh yeah he's he's good is is what uh my past guest edwin black calls the algorithm ghetto the cashless society this technocracy um you know i was reading yesterday now they're talking about dna id cards which is going to be better than biometrics right so that's like the sci-fi film uh gattaca where you live in a society with dna uh, biometric registries and databases and anyone who's who's not biologically pure um is is uh, outcast you know i've got behind me i bought during COVID on ebay from italy for 10 bucks it's the nazi from 1938 achnen pass which was to prove your biological uh purity of the aryan race and then you had the it starts with the g the actual nazi health pass which you know um now now we've got COVID. it's the same principle same thing basically and you know they had the digital passports and now we've see we see the who working on uh, uh this new world government uh, treaty and they're working on these digital ids and digital passports and i'm afraid if they roll this stuff out you they they'll have minute absolute control where if you're a dissident i mean N nigel farage recently had his banks he's he's been yes. debanked uh some uh i think anglican um uh the priest or whatnot he complained about transgender ideology he was debanked and it's like uh th this is going forward my biggest fear what what do you make of uh, all of that yeah uh there's a piece in the book, if I, I don't remember the exact title, uh, in, in inflicting social death. And what they're really wanting to do through all of this is have the ability to inflict social death upon. And what you used to have to do is actually torture someone physically or to kill them physically. But why do that? And why get into all the bloodiness when you can turn them into pariahs uh, sitting in their own house. Um, I was going to respond sarcastically to what you were saying by saying, but boy, it's, it's for your own convenience. It's for your own convenience. And, and that to me is uh, an area, if we're going to fight back on this, we have to talk about that. And what we now are is probably six or seven decades into consumerist culture as in other words my life is all about getting what i need in the most easy and and convenient way possible that is in i think you could make the argument that that has transcended great religions uh, and great spiritual traditions to the point where those people know nothing about a spiritual tradition but they know and have internalized that as their as their way of being. And comfort and, and convenience are key elements of that. 
I can't remember the exact quote. I, I think it was Schwab. He said, we know people will give up freedom for comfort. And this is where, and, and, and you could even take the metaphor further when I was talking to my daughter this morning. How many people in the face of the clearly authoritarian assaults upon citizenry, upon doctors through their professional organizations, upon nurses, upon everyone, how many people decided that doing something uncomfortable might be what they have to do. Now, I'm not going to talk lightly about those things. I know people's salaries are on the line. I know I know it more than you know. <laughs> uh, and yet, you know, what about discomfort for a larger idea? What about the idea of sacrifice for a larger idea? If nothing else, not for yourself, for your children. I mean, this assault on, on the idea of parenthood, I mean, the parenthood is the most sacred office in the world, if you ask me. And to say that, well, yeah, but I'll do what I have to do only if it pleases the authorities for my children. Well, no. And sometimes you might have to say, no, what you're doing for my children threatens my core values, and I'm going to go through some discomfort to support what I know to be true. And I, I, I think that's a, how are we going to face that in a society? I, I, part of me thinks that's going to take care of itself as we become increasingly impoverished through the failure of our, our, our bankrupt empire. So that discomfort will be visited on us. And I think it will be interesting as discomfort is visited on more and more people whether they'll reclaim the idea of rebellion and simply saying, well, I'm just, I'm uncomfortable already. I might as well be myself. And you wonder at what level of decay where that instinct is going to kick in. I, I, yeah. You know, I think that, that what you just mentioned is again, a, a, one of the core uh, keys to all of this where, I've been trying to figure out why are people complying, and a lot of it has to do with, with what you just uh, laid out. And I've always been driven by uh, the search for truth and willing to sacrifice to be put in the place of discomfort for what is right, what is true, for dignity and, and uh, justice. And I've been amazed during the age of Corona, talking to people in the Western world where they're now openly like what you just said they want comfort uh and security over discomfort uh you know they, they want comfort and security even if they have to live a lie um over discomfort and 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 truth and they they've been openly telling me like in the western world I, I was shocked they were telling me literally they support authoritarianism and tyranny these were americans um uh over over you know they, they they're supporting the, this authoritarian authoritarian trend that we're, where we're going which is so anti-american but um so yeah you, you you've also you also mentioned death in your book ever since i was a teenager uh, i've been preoccupied not in a bad way but just it's been on my mind always death and, and eternity which i think is something that keeps you grounded and it's important to think about uh and it, it makes me not you know less afraid of death thinking about it whereas people i think you you know people more of this frightened class they don't think enough about death which is why they're frightened about it so you know any other uh thoughts for that's, us that's a, that's a big topic i'd love to talk more about but i remember sitting as a kid in church and listening to the priest drone on about death i thought oh god why do i want to hear this stuff but I got to a point in my life, and I think we all get to it as we're trying to decide how and who we're going to be as adults. You begin to say, hmm, I've got a limited time on this earth. And death, knowing it and, and accepting its presence, becomes a liberation. Maybe if you talk to me in 10 years when I'm 15 years and I'm decrepit, it, it won't be, I won't be able to talk so breezily about it. But death, and I think you, 
I talk about it as into entering into dialogue with death. Because then that allows you to understand the preciousness of life. It allows you to understand a whole bunch of things. And when you're in dialogue with someone or something, it can't come out of the shadows and surprise you. And one of the things I'm doing in one of the essays is I'm trying to suggest that consumer culture is always telling us death, death can be avoided. You'll get better all the time. Well, you can't. You're going to get old. You're going to get decrepit. And if you have a consciousness of that, you say, hmm. I hope I have the courage to face it with equanimity when it comes. I hope I have this courage. I hope I have that courage. And you begin a dialogue with yourself about hopefully the values that you're going to allow you to stain you through your decrepitude. But what if you've been told, no, it doesn't there. We put the old people away in homes so that the kids never have to know what it looks like to, to, to see their, grand, their beloved grandparent die. And then all of a sudden, someone comes along and says, hey, there's a virus. And rather than reacting vi rationally to it, since this is the first time they've ever dialogued with the shadow of death, they're hysterical. And I think, in, I think we've seen in cultures where death has, a, has not been banished, people dealt much more, um, much more rationally with it. I, was, I spent some time during the pandemic in Croatia. And the Croatians, they know about violence. They know about war. They know about all these things. And it was completely different. They were saying, come on, we got to live this life. And so, yeah, I think it's a huge thing. I always, I always tell people like Unamuno, the great Spanish philosopher, was really the person that put me on this path. And if you ever have a chance, pick him up. He's great. Hard to read, but pretty good. Well, uh, I, I, I guess that last note, uh, that, so any, um, any final, uh, thought for us, you know, it's post COVID, um, you know, again, I, I'm afraid I heard Matt Can Hancock, the former UK health minister saying, uh, you know, the next lockdown is going to come harder and faster. So some of them haven't learned their lessons. Hopefully the citizenry, uh, if they push back harder, it'll be tougher for do for them to do any of this. So any, any final, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of a down note. Um, I think we'd be naive if, with all of the energy and money uh, invested in what really ends up being a three-year social training exercise, which bore them fruits in terms of compliance and 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 bending younger people to the idea that all they need to do is comply. I think we might be naive to think it's not going to come back uh, in many different forms. They'll probably engage in incrementalism for a few years, keep the, uh, keep the ideas, all the lies alive by not allowing frontal um, debunking of them. And then they'll pull them out of the freezer with the next fomented crisis and see just how much of the 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 training for submission uh has stuck and how much consciousness has been raised on the other hand yeah I, i'm gonna be ready i'm gonna be like as soon as some major crisis hits all of the news media and government reactions uh in nations you know worldwide i'm like i i don't i don't i'm not buying it it's a lot i, I well, we're gonna have to evaluate it as you as we as you discuss. You you have to evaluate everything. But immediately, you know, all my all the people around me are gonna be freaked out, and it's like, I was gonna be the guy. He's like, no, no, no stop, <laughs> stop. And so they they get you into that state of freaking out, so you don't you stop thinking. So, uh, anyways, I I, I'm, I highly recommend the book, The Treason of the Experts, COVID, and the Credentials class uh all your the the all your links will be in the description but uh where, where's the best place these days for people to to uh, two primary places at brownstone institute by some of my writing art my writing archive is there and for brownstone i also have a website uh thomas s harrington.com uh it needs a little bit of updating but it has a nice selection of my photography which is another of my passions it has a number of my articles in various languages that come out of my professional past, and it has a number of my articles uh, uh, on COVID as well. And it gives you a sense of who I am and where I'm coming from uh, in terms of 
how this strange case of a hispanist turning into a to a covid covid guy came about but it makes it makes sense the trajectory makes sense to me of course but on the first blush it may not make sense to other people but i hope i've given some reasons to why it, it might make sense no, yeah, that, that's a uh, fascinating. Well, uh, maybe maybe we'll meet one of these days for a tequila somewhere in Mexico or a rakia somewhere in uh, Croatia or elsewhere. And uh, again, thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Thank you very much, Roy. Really, really great. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes, Facebook restricts our page, Reddit and Twitter take down posts, and after the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help geopolitics and empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.